Thank you, and once again, good morning to the students and teachers of the Word of God. Our weekly lesson here is found in Luke, and this will be chapter 14. It's a pretty lengthy uh, lesson, but not very heavy, not a lot of high heavy doctrine in it, so it'll come pretty, pretty easy. And this will be chapter 14, verse uh, 7 uh, to 10. Uh, and then going on to 11, 12, 13, 14, and clear up to uh, ch- uh, 24. 14, 7 to 14, 24 in Luke. And we'll begin as time allows. This is one of the greatest weeks of my life coming up, really, sincerely. Actually, I'm getting a chance to go back and preach for the prisoners again up in Alabama. And I've got three different prisons I'm going to be pre- pre- preaching again. This makes to about, I think, about 160, 170 prisons since my prison ministry began back in 1951. And we always have good results and always have a lot of conversions. And it's a great blessing to be able to lead adult people to Christ when so few of them are even coming to church now to even hear the gospel. We, uh, we, uh, we've always had a very fruitful visits, and I've always come home with a full string of fish. And always I'm happy to know something about the verse that says, Follow me, and I'll make them become fishers of men. Now, this time of the three prisons we're in, the two of them are women's prisons. They're up in Montgomery, near that, in that area. And then another one, uh, a men's prison. Uh, actually, the third one, in this case, is a kind of a, uh, well, it's kind of like uh, an army outfit. It's a place where they take fellows who are under 19 and give them a chance before they go to the big slammers and get in real bad trouble to try to work out a thing with them, kind of a martial type of a, of a church. <laughs> it's a real good thing. And these boys holding out contain fellows that are 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and they're given a couple of weeks here and warned, and then they kind of out in probation after they leave for a while, so we're trying to save them have to go to a big slammer. Because in the big slammers, of course, they practice uh, uh, fornication, and the queers are working there, and you send in their kids 15, 16, 70 years old, you're sending them into a bear trap. But uh, those, these things aren't talked about in the news media, but they go on, they go on. I've been about this work now for... Oh, 63 years, something like that. And I always am glad to see the young kids get saved. Then about a, w- a week later, um, the 23rd and 24th along in there, I'll be in Tallahassee, and that'll be uh, the county jail uh, up there, Leon County Jail with my brother there, Womack. And we always have a great time there. And they usually, usually in those services there, there are about uh, 80 to 90 prisoners all of them adults there, and uh, they get. There have been times when you've had many as as forty first time conversions in those meetings, and it's a blessing. It's a blessing. All right, now we're in Luke chapter uh, fourteen, beginning at verse seven. And he, this is Christ, put forth a parable to those which were tri- were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms. Uh, bidden to what? Well, in this case, to a feast. Uh, notice or uh, a particular kind in verse 8, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, so forth and so on. And then later on when he talks about these things, he says, when you make a feast, verse 13. So he's going to talk about a wedding feast here and people been coming to it. And it's a parable. That's a parallel. That's a, something that goes alongside something else that has another application. And it's given as a as an example of it. And he put forth a parable to those who were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, uh, saying to them, Now they're bidden to a feast. They get an invitation to come. And then they go. There are different places to sit when you go at a big feast. And some of them are in different rooms, and some of them are in different... Uh, Tables, he says, be careful how you choose out of the chief rooms, saying to them, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room. 
That indicates uh, several small rooms, of course, open and joined, and it indicates uh, high seats and low seats for special guests and less special guests. Then he says, when you're bidden to one of those weddings and come in there, don't sit down in the highest room. Let a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. That is, when they come in, let the fellows having the feast uh, cha- to decide who's going to sit where. And he that bade thee, the fellow that gave thee the invitation, uh, to come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin the shame to take the lowest room. He said, Well, you come in there going up to where the big shots are, the main uh, people who have been invited, and take a seat with them, lest the fellow who gave the feast see you up there and come in and says, You can't sit here. You've got to sit down in this low place down here where the rest of the <laughs> common people are. The lowest room. That is... Uh, Thou begin with shame. This is an illustration of pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. A fellow coming up and sitting up with the big shots in the first seat next to the uh, potential bride and bridegroom, and then they make him move down further with uh, some of the uh, less lesser important people and people who are not related to them. And then he says this, when, when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. Uh, be humble, be humble. Pride goeth before destruction, the Holy Spirit before a fall. When you are bidden, sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say to thee, if he wants to say it to you, Friend, go up higher. Then thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. That, that, what, that, is, that they get the ones that are honored. The worship here is not like a thing of uh, praying to God or of religion. But you want to be in a place where you'll be given that much uh, respect. All right, he says that you'll have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalted himself shall be abased, general rule, uh, applicable anywhere. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted anywhere. That's true in any walk of life. Pride goeth before destruction, the Holy Spirit before a fall. Whoever exalts himself shall be abased, put down, put down on the base, on the bottom, base. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted, he'll be raised up. I learned that in the infantry real quick when I was a young man, coming in a military family, and all of them, well, most of them infantrymen, we had one artilleryman in there in four generations. When I went to the citizen military training camp, before I went to reserve officer training, which is before OCS, I learned th- one thing about infantry combat. The first rule is get down, and the second rule is stay down, and the third rule is don't get up. Now that's talking about when you're in an artillery bombardment or a bombing, and the thing is stay low. And uh, he says, he says, whoever exalts himself should be abased, and he that humbles himself should be exalted. You stay flat down, get out of the fire, you you be able to stand up after it's over. You don't walk around in it. Verse 12, then said he also to him that bade him, that we, we'd say bidden him, and we gave him the invitation. Then he said to him that bade him, he said, when thou makest a, din- a, 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 a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, the close people to you, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, you don't have to send them a special thing, lest they also bid thee, bid, uh, bid thee again, and a, com, a recompense made thee. Now this is Old Testament, and this is what you to take care of the poor folks. And you're, in verse 13, when you make a feast, now that's not just an ordinary uh, uh, feed, that's a special thing, like a party. Well, now make us a feast called the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Now, notice that thing. That's a special meal that you set up for poor folks. And he says, if you do this, you'll be doing the right thing because they can't pay you back. Notice in the Old Testament, you're not told over to the government for all this stuff. The individual is put, put, put on the individual. Helping poor folks is not entrusted to some group, some off and up country, part of the the country where they're going to tax you for it. That's what they do over in Muhammad's outfit. They take so much out, the government takes so much out uh, to take care of the poor folks. In the Old Testament, the individual is supposed to take care of the poor folks. When you make a feast, 
you call the poor. And thou shalt be blessed, verse 14, for they, the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, for they cannot recompense thee. They can't give you something in return. In plain words, it's a tr- true, true gift with no payment coming back for it. It's something you do because you want to obey God and help the poor folks. Uh, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just after death. Now, you're not going to find an American sitting out like that. But you're told to set your affection on things above and not on things on this earth. And where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And now he's saying, if you help these poor folks out and take care of them, and they can't pay you back, then after you're, you die, at the resurrection, you get paid back. Now that's mentioned many, many places in the Bible. And that's over there in the book of Revelation there. And he talks about the time when the white throne judgment comes. There's some people getting rewarded there because their names are the book of life. Now, usually when a, a Bible teacher teaches the Bible, he teaches that there'll be only unsaved people at the white throne judgment. And, of course, that's wrong. There are some people there who are names in the book of life who are not in the church age. They were saved during the tribulation. They didn't take the mark. There are some there that are saved in the 1,000 years Christ reigns upon the earth, saved by the works that are set up in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 at the Sermon on the Mount. But that gets them some heavy stuff. But at that time, the, the people will be rewarded for their works. And those things are cases where we're in the tribulation and the millennium. And in the Old Testament, you have case, cases where works and of faith come together, and there have to be the works with it. If you don't believe that, read Romans chapter 2, where you're told in the Old Testament, when a man did right and had the right works, he was rewarded with eternal life. That changed. It changed that when Christ made the payment for all kinds of sins in the tribulation, in the church age, it is called, today is the day of salvation. Today. The law came by Moses that has works in it, but grace and truth that doesn't have works in it came by Jesus Christ. Now he says, when you make this thing here, you make it, and he calls it two things. He calls it a dinner or a supper in verse 12. And strangely enough, that's what the South uh, kept and uh, the Northerners lost after the Civil War. Up there, that middle meal is called a lunch up there, and then you have a dinner at night. The Germans, to this day, have the big meal in the middle of the day, and the evening is a supper, and that's how they do it down in Dixie. The midday is supposed to be the big meal, that's a dinner, and the supper is supper time, that's night. It's not not a great big dinner. Uh, The Mexicans seem to have caught on to it, too, and whether or not they eat the big dinner in the middle of the day or not, I don't know, but they do one thing, they have a siesta, as soon as it's over, because, I guess, suppose, because it's the biggest meal they eat in the day. That's the one they rest after. Smart people. Make a dinner, and then a supper. But this thing is a special thing. It's not a regular meal, because it says when you make a feast, this is people invited in for a meal. And he said, Thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed, paid back for where, where, what for, for your work recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Now, he does mention the judgment seat of Christ here because at the judgment seat of Christ, you'll meet the one who died for your sins. And where you're reading here in Luke, he hadn't died for anybody's sins. He's up walking around. And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Now, actually, there are two resurrections when you get into it. You're told this is the first resurrection. You're told that in in, uh, Revelation chapter 20, after the tribulation. That is, the first resurrection is not complete until the uh, great tribulation is over. Then the second resurrection is after the tribulation, as after the uh, reign of Christ, and that contains all the unsaved people that weren't saved. It also contains people who died in the reign of Christ a thousand years after the tribulation. Now, that's heavy stuff, and your, uh, your average Bible teacher is not going to dare even discuss it. 
because he's always trying to take what's the dispensation you're in now and trying to stick it ahead of you where it doesn't exist or stick it behind you where it doesn't exist. But uh, those of you who are called to teach the book better learn how to teach it right. Different dispensations have different ways to go. And brother and sister, when you get to the reign of Christ on earth, nobody is saved by grace through faith because they walk by sight and not by faith. Christ is right there. Well, that's the thing you get into, and that's heavy stuff, and too heavy for the modern Christian. Now he says in verse 15, When one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, the only thing he just said about taking the right seat when you come into a feast, and taking care of the poor, he said to him, Blessed is he that eateth bread in the kingdom of God. That's the fellow there listening to Christ uh, expound what he did, and now here's his comment. Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, you know what's peculiar about that? The one he's talking to has a greatest follower you ever saw, Paul, the apostle, tell you the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. And this fellow is saying, Blessed he that eats bread. It is. Look out, that's in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not a physical, literal, visible kingdom. And when you begin to talk about having feasts and people sitting on a table and eating stuff and getting paid back, you're talking about something going on when Christ comes back and reigns on earth. And that's not just the kingdom of God present, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The, that's not just the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this fellow's statement is only half true. You'll, you'll eat bread in the kingdom of God when Christ comes back because he's righteous and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. It's a spiritual kingdom and a political kingdom. So when he said this, Christ doesn't make any comment on it. He just skips it. And look what he says. Then said he unto them, when the fellow, fellow made that statement about blessed the you eating bread in the kingdom of God, he said to that fellow, a certain man made a great supper. That's the evening meal. That's something over there at the end of the church age. That great supper is called a marriage supper in um, in Matthew. And that is a marriage that takes place after the church age is over. A certain man made a great supper and bad money. Now there's a picture of a marriage supper and people being invited to a marriage supper where Christ marries the bride. And sent it so it took place in this age. Because at the end of this age, the bride has to go up there before they get married. And he sent his servants at supper time. That's evening. That's around six o'clock in the afternoon. At supper time. That's the end coming near the end of the church age right before the wedding. And sent his servant at supper time. Now you can put that one down on the age you're living in. To say to them, we're bidden, come. That's the message. For all things are now ready. They'll be ready then. They're not ready when Christ says that. When he says that, he hasn't died for your sins yet. You've got to get it right. When he dies for his sins, you have a whole age there for 2,000 years where people are invited to come because it's open for them because Christ has paid for the sins. They can come to the wedding if they will. Come for all things are now ready. So what happened to the church age? And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. This is aimed, when he says this, to Jews under the law. And they, with all one consent, began to make excuse. Well, he invited a lot of people who didn't come. And there it goes. And there it goes, and you can't do anything with it if you accept the wedding garment when it's offered to you going down the street by the, the uh, inviter. You better put it on. One fellow shows up at the wedding after the rapture, and he doesn't have a robe on. And the Lord says to him, uh, how come you don't have, haven't got the right robe on? And he was speechless, and he's thrown out. And he goes to hell. That's back in Matthew 22. In plain words, the wedding guest, the wrong, wrong person tried to get in. Somebody get, tried to get in there without uh, the right robe. And we know who we're clothed with. We're clothed with Jesus Christ and have put away the old man and put on the new man. You better have try to get into that wedding 
in your condition that you're in unless you've been born again and got the right kind of clothes on. 21. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. He said, I asked this guy to come, and this fellow said, uh, no, I uh, need to go to a wedding. And one fellow said, no, I bought a piece of land, got to go look at it. This is in Matthew 22. And another fellow comes by there and says, no, I can't do that thing right now. I've bought a, a yoke of oxen. i go, got to go try them out. And the master of the house, being angry, he said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. That's what he just said about putting up the supper. And there they are. That's what you call David's 400. And back in the Old Testament in First Samuel, when David was out there in the woods, the people that are poor and the people that are upset and terrified and in debt and so forth and so on, gather together him, he comes to be captain over them. That's a picture of the church age. And only the people that have a need... Except the, the invitation. The ones that are set out and think they're pretty good and got a pretty good religion to make and pretty good money and got a pretty good education, they don't care to put on the clothes and come to the marriage. They figure they're going to make it with their own clothing. And every man at his best state is altogether vanity, and the heart is a deceitful of all things that are desperately wicked, and who can know it? And all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Got it? Go on quickly into the streets and the lane of the city and bring him to the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. In type and bar- in, in, a par- in a parable, that's the unsaved, the poor, the people that don't, can't, don't qualify, not the rich folks, spiritually. He's a pic- this picture of unsaved man- man- mankind, the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind, blind spiritually, limping spiritually. Uh, bad, bad composition, uh, spiritually bankrupt. Some of them might say, I'm, I'm, uh, rich and increased with goods, and the Lord say, you're poor, you're wretched, you're naked, you're blind. That's the bunch. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. All right, go out and get them. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in from the uh, fields of sin. Bring the wandering ones to Jesus. That's it. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. Bring in the blind, but now I see. That's the business. One good picture of it is a picture there in Acts 3 with a fellow sitting there by the gate, beautiful, and, and can't getting, getting psalm, uh, getting a palms, getting a, a handout from people going in because he was born bl- uh, blind. And one fellow there in around Acts chapter 3 is born crippled and had never walked anywhere. The blind man is in John chapter uh, 9, and he was born blind. This fellow is born crippled, Acts chapter 8. And so there's the halt right there, and there's the blind right there. And they're both pictures of people who believe on Jesus Christ and get healed. So you've got the healing thing with you, and in the age in which you live, you're to go into the highways and the byways and get get to them, the prisons and the alleys and the hospitals, the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind, spiritually as well as physically. And the servant said, Lord, it is done, thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Well, whosoever will, let him come. And the Lord said to the servant, Go out into the highways. Now get it. Go, go after them. Find them out. Search them out. Seek out the sheep that are lost. That's what Christ did. The good shepherd came down and he said, If I had all of them down there but lost one, I'd go out and find the one that's lost. That's what you Christians are supposed to be doing until you're called out. The wedding isn't yet. The wedding is after you get called out. And when you get up there, you'll see how many people got up there because you led them to Christ. Every man's treasure is in heaven, and where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Is that where yours is this morning? And the Lord said to the servant, Go into the highways and hedges, on the highways and byways, the big ways and the small ways, and compel them to come in. Of course, that's not... You come there else, so I'm going to break your neck. <laughs> it isn't compelling getting an arm lock on them and breaking them in that way. 
but it's with your talk and your begging with them, pleading with them, and reasoning with them, and praying for them, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Whosoever let him come and take of the water of life freely. For I say unto you, verse 24, this is how the lesson ends for 24 and verse 24, uh, For I say unto you, that not, not, none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Well, the ones that were bidden that turn him down, he's talking about. He's talking about the ones that had a chance and didn't take it. I say none of those men which were bidden, they did get an invitation, shall taste of my supper. Why not? They didn't take it. There's no second invitation after they've turned him down and refused to come. There's no second invitation. Now, something there is real clear, ought to be real clear to you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ shall last. Life is short. Death is sure. Sin the curse. Christ the cure. You going to be there at the wedding day? You going to be there when God finishes things up? You going to be there at the judgment seat of Christ where you belong at that time and not at the white throne judgment? Not at that time? Well, what's the answer? Simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. With the heart, man believes in the righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. Those aren't works. They're receiving the works that Christ did. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. That's his work. And call upon him. What? For the one who do, does the work. Calling upon Christ and receiving Christ your Savior is not a work. That's an invitation to accept, a, an invitation to go home and be with the Lord when uh, the day of the Lord has come. That isn't a work. That's something you should do, except somebody else's works if you want to get to heaven. It's strange how they keep talking about that Christ dying for everybody, but they don't tell you how to receive him. Isn't that something? You know what they do? They run around and say, well, just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, see? That's what he told the Philippian jailer, but he didn't stop there. He talked to him after he took him out and got him to the house and led his whole house to Christ. Led them to Christ. They accepted somebody. Whoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ shall be shaved, saved. How? Saved? As many as received him. To them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And believing on his name is Jesus saves. May the Lord bless you and good day.